All right, all you. Public speaking, there's a lot of roots and things you have to do to even become one and be good at it. There's different types and why you need to become one. Some groups, there's like different groups you can talk to. There's dyadic speaking, which is just two people talking to each other with a normal conversation that's every day. And then there's small group where it's like just three, four people. Three or more, yeah. Good that call. you're speaking to. And there's mass, which is like a big, like kind of a bigger group, like a medium-sized group, like 15, 10 people. And then public speaking, which is a big population and the center of attention is on you. And you just have everybody looking at you and everybody's focused. Would you consider mass, YouTube channel, live streaming, different things like that? Probably. Okay. Well, my kid has a channel and he's got four followers. So I'd consider that a small group. Yeah. <laughs> I don't consider it mass just yet. Then it's good for future jobs and what you want to do in your life. Why? Because for like interviews and stuff, you're not gonna want you're not gonna walk up to an interview and just not know what you're talking about and not be prepared. I like that. That'll and then work. Civic engagement, communicating with your peers and just everyone around you is good because you're not gonna be stuttering over your words and not really knowing what you're talking about. And then as a student, it helps you with like presentations and simple stuff, talking to your teachers, like kind of professionally. And then it gives you a voice and it gives you a reasoning so you feel confident in what you're saying. So if I have a blog that I write every day and just has a picture of me, does that still give me a voice? I mean, if you talk about it. But if it's just like, I would think so. Could the written word be a voice? I would think so. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why people write on bathroom walls. And then there's a couple ways to build up to becoming one. An oral style of language, you don't want to focus too much on saying things that you don't know what you're talking about or just stuttering over your words every five seconds. Vocal fillers. Yeah. <laughs> know what I'm saying? Yeah. Audience attention is another big one. You want to be able to have your audience's attention and not let them be sitting there on their phones or talking to their neighbors. You're you going to get into that? You're going to get into audience attention, how to keep yeah. people attentive? Okay, good. And you want meaning behind it. You don't want to walk up to something that you don't know what you're talking about. You want to have meaning and have it be something that's important to you and important to everyone around you. Public speaking has been around since probably the beginning of time because before the internet, that's the only way. I know, but I'm picturing a caveman standing on a yeah. rock. <laughs> That's the only way you know anything, like throughout a community when you didn't have the internet, was you talk to them. And then this specifically is from ancient Rome and Greece. They, when they gave speeches, and like the practice of giving speeches was called rhetoric, and they split it into five different steps. The first being invention, when they decided what facts or what they were going to use to support their argument in their speech. And then they would arrange it. And they would decide, how do I want to arrange the facts and evidence that I just found to get my argument across effectively? And then they chose, the, they talked about the style. What, how do they, what words they want to use? How do they want to come across to get their argument across effectively? It's all, it all comes back to how they wanted to get their argument across effectively, especially when, like I said, they didn't have the internet. So th that was, you only have one chance. You can't go back and watch it again. You have to get your argument effectively across to a large amount of people in one shot. <laughs> <laughs> would you say it's high pressure, low pressure, medium pressure? I would say it's probably pretty high pressure, especially if you're like a king and you really need to tell your people this important oh, thing. Good point. Like, you can't go back and tell them again. Okay. But we chose it was the fourth step, which would be memory. They like when you only have one chance. Like I said, you have to be able to give your speech. Well, in the book they said artfully. Which Describe is, artfully in Liliana's terms. What do you consider artfully? I would say that giving a speech artfully is. I've been saying a lot, but being able to have everyone in your audience understand you okay. 
J-Rod might hear me and interpret it different, what I'm saying differently than Paige might. Sure. And so I need to be able to have everyone understand okay. what I'm saying. And See, when I think of artfully, I think of personality. Tiger's going to give you an example here in a second because I'm going to ask him something. Because he and I were chatting. Without giving away the name, would you consider that last class artfully taught? No. What was missing? Engaged with. Really? Like, how was the teacher engaging you guys? Just the effort. Okay. So there's no connection, no personality, or just information? <laughs> Yeah, it takes it. It's a trick. I mean, it, it's a trick because you guys know when it's just information regurgitation. I can't even imagine sitting in a class like that. Ugh. I'd get up, walk around the halls. And the final step to delivering a speech was the, the actual delivery of the speech. So the nonverbal cues or behaviors, like lots of gestures or your facial expression or your stance. How can you have too many gestures? Yes. Can you smile too much? Probably. I think so. If I do the whole speech like this, it reminds me of that movie Smile, and now I see part two's out. That creeps me out. And with the nonverbal, so how your audience unconsciously views you, also your vocal behavior. So saying um between every single word. Uh, and using, using yeah. big words that they don't understand. Good point. Things like that. Question. The three of you. You need the only one you can answer it. Uh, you're sitting in an auditorium, about a thousand people, and there's a stage. The speaker is introduced, but comes out in front, down with the people, as opposed to on the stage, not verbally. What does that say to you as an audience member? There there's no right or wrong answer. What were you thinking? That they're one of you, they're not above you. Okay, I like that one. Mike? I was just going to say they're on equal ground. Okay. They want to be involved, they don't want to just be talking directly. I will not come out on a stage. I will not. I come down with the audience or I come from the back or I come off from the side because I'm not some guru preaching. I think that nonverbal gesture right there, you nailed it. I want to be part of the audience with all the other people out there. So it definitely, stance makes a difference. Now, when you're preparing for an event or preparing for a speech, uh, there's a lot of things you got to keep in mind. Um, what are some things that you got to Can you have just one point? No. No? I mean, yeah, you can. Well, she back there doing the Takimbi Mutombo in honor of him right now. Ooh. What do you say? Is that a no? I don't think so. I think you can have one point and then your overarching point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have one point and then your overarching point. My biggest thing is if I go to my parents when I was younger, and I have one argument why they should let me have the car, and they shoot that down. I have no fallback arguments. That's what I always look at. So I always try to do three, personally. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but one, you risk going in, even though it's easier for your audience to remember. Okay. When you're developing your speech, um, practice is important. You have to practice what you're going to talk about whether it's with your dog, your mirror, your parents. You have to practice somehow and actually get a feel for um, it's important to be aware of, obviously, like we were talking about earlier, nonverbal expressions or delivery and facial expressions, gestures, movements. Um, it's important to keep the audience um, interactive with your hands. Make sure everybody's listening. Keep your eyes moving around. At oh, listen to people who never change volume, never smile, never laugh, nothing. And you got to sit there for an hour to an hour and a half. Welcome to hell. Question, we've got to go back though. Last one on tips. Would you guys look through the outlines? Check those out. How'd you feel about them? Especially that one. How, what do you feel about the outlines the format that they've got? It's pretty intense. Yeah, I don't know if I would necessarily enjoy following the specifics. 
It's predictable for one thing. Yeah, I can't stand predictability. It drives me nuts. Yeah, everybody just, follows the same outline and follows the same I was worried when it's outlined, people tend to read it. You guys like what you're doing right now. You've got a couple words, but you're telling me and relating it to me. You're talking to me. You're teaching me. Don't just regurgitate information with me. Um, it is necessary to speak with purpose. Like, make sure your, make sure your audience um, understands that you mean business, kind of. Like, you're not here to just, yeah. Oh, absolutely, I agree. Um, it's, again, it's important to know what you're talking about. You've got to do extensive research on whatever topic you're going through. Just like how all of us have to do this presentation, we go through the book, we do our research. And find out what we're about. I agree. So a lot of speeches, like everybody gets anxious, nobody really knows. There's some people that don't know what they're doing when it comes to them, especially when they're in a group of people that they don't know and don't never have been around. There's these um, types, like ways to manage anxiety and control it when it comes to a speech. You wanna figure out what's causing you to be nervous, whether it's the group of people, whether it's you just are just overall nervous and you just don't, aren't comfortable on the topic, even though you should be, like you just didn't get enough practice, you're just not as comfortable as you should be. So you can prepare and practice, get plenty of practice, like we said, talk to anything. You talk, walk up to a bush and talk to it, it doesn't really matter. And sometimes it can be better to think of it as a conversation, like you're walking up to a friend and communicating with them, because especially if you know the people that you're gonna be around and you know how they think, then just talk to them like you would in the hallway. What do you think is the main cause of anxiety prior to giving a speech? Um, probably not really knowing. Either one, not feeling comfortable with what you're talking about, like not getting enough practice, okay. or just not confidence. Okay, double trouble, what do you think? I think that it can all be boiled down to being worried about what other people are gonna think Absolutely. Like yeah, I'd agree with both those. What do you think, Chuck? Uh, sorry. Um, it's, it all, yeah, it all just depends on what people are thinking. Way to play off the ladies, but I think that, number one, worried what people are going to think. Number two, you know, you fear of failure because am I going to bomb this thing? My problem with that kind of mindset, let's pretend J-Rod's getting the ball. If he goes, man, they call his play, and all of a sudden he goes, man, I hope I don't fumble. That's not the mindset you want, because now he's thinking about fumbling. He should grab the ball and think, give me the damn ball, I'm going to score. I'm running over people, that kind of thing. As you get ready to go out and give a speech going, I'm giving them me. This is who I am. Hopefully they like it. If they don't, I'm going to be okay with that. So definitely good. I think those two are positive. There's a couple things that I also think can cause – public anxiety with public speaking is if you only focus on one part of your speech, like if I only focused on this one slide and wasn't focusing on any of the other slides, that's when mistakes are going to happen, that's when the stuttering is going to come out, the ums and the uhs, and everything you don't want is going to come out on the other slide that you're not focusing on, or even anything, like any part of your conversation. There's types of anxiety, there's just not doing it there's just not you don't have experience you're brand new to something feeling different like you don't that's kind of goes along with what you think other people are going to think some people get really nervous being the center of attention they don't like it they don't want to do it and then the pre-preparation and just being prepared if you aren't pre-prepared before your speech you're not going to be prepared during your speech that's huge no that's huge to feel confident and and then your performance is really important. That kind of goes with everything. That's just how you deliver your speech. If you're just standing there like a bump on a log. What would you do if you're a sweater? You sweat terribly. What would you do? Stop looking at people. Just start asking. You're worried you're going to get up there. You're going to have pit sweat, belly sweat, butt sweat. I mean, all that stuff. What could you do? Because if you're sitting there going, oh, my God, I know I'm going to sweat. That's too long. Do what? You got a layer. You could layer. You could. Do you guys ever see cornstarch? You ever see, you know baby powder? Okay, cornstarch. I used to use it for football underneath my pads because I'd get back knee from my pads sweating. So my mom packed, um, she'd give me this bag and I'd pack the cornstarch over my shoulders and put it on. It absorbed all the sweat. But when I got done, it came off like a paste. 
So it was amazing. Cornstarch works amazing, extra deodorant, that kind of thing. So I've had a lot of people worry about sweating. What can you do if you're the red creepy crawler of nervousness when people get really red? How did you deal with that? Anybody from the audience? You got any ideas with the red creeper, I like to call it? Makeup. What? Makeup. Makeup? That'd be a tough one. I'm not putting on base Deep makeup for anybody. Damn straight. Where did you pull that out of? His Chromebook. His face did you just Google it? No, Google I, it. my face turned red. It's bad. You're right. You just take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Like, um, what was it? Uh, not Billy Madison. What's the other one? The golf one. Happy Gilmore. Go to your happy place. Take a deep breath. Go to your happy place and just relax. They both are the same, but I get the movies mixed up. I don't remember Billy Madison going to his happy place. And it was a crush on the teacher. What else you got for me? I'm liking it so far. Well, before I move on to my next slide, I think that going along with what Olivia said, if when we were playing this, we said, okay, we have six slides, so we can each do two slides. We'll go in a rotation, you know? And then if Olivia was only to focus on the two slides that she knew that she was going to present and read, then when Michael or I were reading a slide and then you ask her a question about our slides, that's why I'm doing that. <laughs> that's exactly so why I'm doing that. It's important, like she said, to know everything Learn the that chapter. you're talking about. But what I want is you guys go through the chapter and you find what you think is important in your lives and give it back to me. That's why teachers, you know, a lot of them, you got basically to me, there's three types. The first one teaches the curriculum verbatim. The second one teaches it, ties in a few things. The third one picks out what I would want to know as a student getting ready for life. I look through student eyes, so it's completely different. Such as? Such as anticipating distractions, chatty people, people not paying attention, people walking in late, loud noises, like when I was giving my intro speech, the fire yeah. alarm. Yeah, so you're right. Good, great example. You have to have a plan. You basically just have to have a plan for anything that could show up while you're speaking. So question, you see a couple turds, like maybe they're sitting in the back of the room and they like to look at other people and make faces and do different things. What can you do without calling them out to possibly grab that attention back to you? Say something shocking. Say something that they would want to listen to. Oh, see, I refuse to cater to the, the bad people. But what I'm thinking is, could you do something with voice fluctuation? Maybe lower your voice down? I don't want to make crazy noises, anything like that, because then people would wonder why you got let go of a, a sane asylum. But how about maybe bringing your word up or stopping just total silence? Not staring at them, but maybe staring at a couple people next to them or something, calling somebody on that. There's so many different ways to do that. That's the problem. You know, if somebody's sleeping, I used to get really upset when I was teaching. Then I always wonder now, I wonder what happened last night, why are the kids so tired? I did that because I found out one of my kids was leaving school and was digging graves and working in the graveyard until like 10, 11 at night. And some of the other kids were claiming kind of he smelled bad. He didn't have time, he was exhausted to shower. So it's one of those things, I never look at a kid sleeping as an insult to me. There's just different ways to handle it. Okay, what else you got? Those are things that you can do as a speaker when you're speaking, but as a listener, as someone in the audience, you also have a responsibility to the speaker and also to yourself if you want to learn the information that they're giving you, which is why you should practice active listening. You need, you can't just sit there and let it go in one ear and out the other. You have to focus on the words that they're saying. And it's not even just about what I'm saying. You can think to yourself, you can have your own thoughts while I'm talking and relate it to your own life. You don't have to share that. Absolutely. But you can think about what I'm saying and relate it to yourself and take the important parts of what I'm saying and the important parts to you and apply that to active, your own spe life. active speakers will listen. They will look at you. They will smile. They will nod their heads. 
you know, some, you know, you'll, you'll get the ones in the audience that are on their phone the entire freaking time, and I ignore them. I completely ignore them. I, I have no use for them. If they didn't come here and they're forced to listen, I'm not going to force them. But God help when karma comes and they get the same treatment, they won't deal with it real well. Even though you should be active listening, there are also different types of listeners. Yep. People oriented means you feel like emotions when you're speaking. You look for emotional relatability and things of that sort. And mm -hmm. action oriented means you're thinking about what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next. Sometimes those type of people can be a little bit impatient, yep. but that's it's just the way that they listen. That's not wrong. Yep. Content oriented listeners are really focused on the content of what is being said, like what I'm saying and what's on my slides. They're all about the content of what the speech is. Right. And time oriented, just looking at the clock. Oh. oh when is this going to be over? How long is this going to last? And not none of these types of listeners are bad. It's just who you are. Bingo. You it takes discipline to focus. In this, today's world, with swipe left, swipe right, seven-second videos and everything, patience is a minimal. Just get on the road and drive. No patience out there. And then there is an art, I would say, to giving people criticism. Huge. You have to know how to criticize. Because and, and criticism isn't always bad. It can be if you don't know how to do it or if you're just trying to be rude. they give you any techniques in the chapter or you know of any techniques when you're going to do that? Compliment sandwich. Well, explain. You're so close. That's almost exactly what it is. Give me an example. One thing they can do better and it was another nice thing that they did well. I like, yep. Give them a compliment. Hey, maybe next time you might think about trying, but I want you to know I really love it. It works great. It really does. I call it the Oreo cookie. I like compliment sandwich more. Giving criticism, you need, when you're listening, let's say that I was talking about something political. Maybe you don't agree with me, but if you were to criticize me, you shouldn't just criticize me about the fact that you don't agree. You need to be open to listening to things and understanding things that you may not necessarily agree with, leading into, not the next one, but you need to focus on the speech, not the speaker. If you don't agree with my values as a person, that's not what we're criticizing. We're criticizing the speech that I gave. Maybe you think that I gestured too much, maybe you thought I smiled too much. It's about the speech. It's not about me as a person. Right. What I but what if they have the most incredible information ever, but they are the most Boring speaker on the planet. Monotone, never looks up, pretty much reading the speech. But it's great information. Do you really tune into it? Because I know a lot of people the opposite. My God, they're flamboyant, their personality is great, they're outgoing, but they don't know a damn thing they're talking about. I love listening to them though. It's almost like the presidential debate, but anyway, sorry. Like, like I said, there's different types of listeners. There's also different types of speaking. So you need to be able, when you do criticism, you need to be able to adjust to the type of speaker that I am when you're criticizing me. If you think I took too long and you're a time-oriented listener, that shouldn't be the basis of your criticism. I agree. Because it's just different. I agree. And like I said, you need to offer compliments with your criticism, the, the compliment sandwich. Yep. And you need to be specific. You can't just say, oh, I think you could have had more information. No. You could say. What was the information? Yeah. I think you could have added a little more about this specific point. I think you could have elaborated on this or this or this. Perfect. Uh, Mike's back. Do you have ethics, Michael? Yes. Yeah, right, just check. Uh, when it comes to ethical public speaking, uh, ethics is the study of moral conduct, and in order to apply it to our speeches, we need to apply moral conduct to our speeches. Um, first, you need to demonstrate competence and character. Uh, you need to demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. Again, back to the development spectrum, you know what you're talking about. It's important to um, 
make sure the audience knows you know what you're talking about by adding how long you've done this thing, some statistics about it that you found, something like that. You have to respect the audience's values. You have to know who you're talking to um, and understand how they think and feel about things related to your topic before you just go out there. And so when I'm researching where I'm going, because I speak differently in Minnesota than I do in Alabama. Alabama's right in the heart of the Bible Belt. You gotta be real careful. No, absolutely no, not even damn or ass. I mean, you gotta, and not that I'm really swearing when I'm doing this, but sometimes I will say damn, and I make sure as I'm practicing, I know exactly where I'm at, what I can do and what I can say. And it gets right down to one time I took my shirt off and underneath it I had a Steeler sweatshirt because I was speaking in Dallas. You should have heard the crowd booing. And I'm laughing because we had just beaten them. This was about six, seven years ago. I can't remember exactly what it was. But I was having fun with them. I wasn't slamming on them. So we committed that. Is any part of that, did you guys catch anything in that chapter about ethos, pathos, and logos? Ethos, pathos? Okay. We'll get into that later because it's a little tricky, but it's exactly what you're talking about up in there, kind of. What else you got? It is important to use your freedom of speech responsibly. Like as he was saying, knowing where you're at, some people aren't gonna um, want to add the same language as other places. Like in Alabama, as he was saying, you're not gonna want to cuss compared to maybe like in New York, for example. There were the members in the audience, some carried Bibles with them. That's intimidating. Or if let's say for some reason you're speaking at a uh, a gay pride convention, you're not gonna want to about how it's wrong the Bible says that's a great example wrong in the Bible or anything like that you're going to want to speak to issues that relate to them agree good example Credit, crediting sources is also a crucial aspect of speech when you're using someone else's words or studies or anything they did you should always orally credit them always yep. mention them mention what they said quote it I have people steal stuff from my speeches and then they use it. I get no mention whatsoever and it pisses me off because technically I have copyright for that. I've never pursued it, but it's one of the worst things you can do. If I borrow a quote or I borrow a picture, I always give credit to the photographer or whoever wrote it, anything like that. Right down to Albert Einstein. Because when you are doing that, you don't want to just take somebody else's artwork. But what it does non-verbally, it makes you even more credible by giving credit to other people, that you're not stealing it. It's a non-verbal way of really getting some positive feedback from the audience. Uh, if you have a speech regarding the public discourse or public issues or anything like that, you wanna stay positive and appeal to the betterment of society rather than your own self-interest. For example, if you're talking about taxes, you and let's say you are a rich person and the taxes will go down for you or the taxes will go up for you because your company is over a certain amount of money. Yep. Um, when that happens, you, you don't want to talk about how um, it's horrible for you and how it's going to worsen you if your audience is full of middle class citizens. Basically, yeah. Taylor Swift endorsing Kamala Harris right now. She's a billionaire. She doesn't care about prices in the economy. She can afford it. That really upset a lot of people. I don't care. I don't listen to it. For someone like Kamala Harris talking about um, lowering prices for middle class and lowering taxes and doing all these things, someone like <coughs> someone like Taylor Swift who is not going to affect at all. I mean, her opinion doesn't. You bet so. Uh, ethical ground rules. There's some ground rules you have to follow. Uh, these are just some important ones. Be trustworthy. Uh, your audience should never have to question whether what you said is true or not. They should never have to go fact check you or anything like that. If you do get it from somewhere, make sure you credit the source so they can go fact check you if you really want. Um, demonstrate respect. Uh, it's important to respect your audience if you want them to respect you. Make eye contact, all that kind of stuff. Um, make sure you be res make sure you make responsible speech choices. Um, when you have a crowd full of uh, people that may not agree with what you're saying, you still want to explain what you're saying, but make sure you do it responsibly in a way that's not going to get the crowd to overreact or do anything that you not want to or just get less interest. It's important to demonstrate fairness. Um, if you're talking
talking about two different groups of people, you want to talk about them the same amount, or just don't refer to one group less than another, or like refer to them as less than another. And also back to being community minded, talking about the betterment of society instead of your own personal interest again. Bingo. Give more details, you betcha, I love it. I'm glad you picked up on that. Well done.